In 2013, the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service entered into a cooperative agreement with the South Dakota No-Till Association and IGRO, SDSU Extension, for delivering the latest soil health and productivity technology to South Dakota farmers and ranchers. A series of four local events were held in South Dakota in Sioux Falls, Watertown, Belfouche, and Mitchell. Everybody keeps asking me when I'm going to retire, you know, and, and uh, that must mean they think I'm old. We actually did uh, no-till at Redfield. Um, we started managing Redfield in 83 and, and left there in 1990. And Ray always likes to say that he ran, he opened the Redfield farm and I closed it. That's not quite true. They, they had a farm there in the 50s, so and you're not that old, Ray. So. <laughs> Uh, but when I started at Redfield, there was 1,900 acres of soybeans in Swink and, uh, Swink and uh, Brown County combined. And I almost didn't pass my PhD because I made the stupid statement. When they asked me what I was going to do at Redfield, I made the stupid statement of telling Larry Fine that I thought we could grow soybeans in the River Valley without irrigation. And Larry Fine, for you guys that are old enough to remember, was the irrigation research guy that spent his lifetime working on the Wahi project and most of the young guys here don't even know the Wahi project so I won't go into that but uh, one of the things that we keep talking about is different kinds of tillage and no-till and whatever no-till is a tool that helps us control our ecosystem that's really what we do but we've got a lot of things uh, vertical tillage and Oh, I don't know, all kinds of different tillage things. And people say, well, there's no commonality amongst these. They're all different. <laughs> well, if there is commonality amongst tillage tools. Uh, all tillage tools destroy soil structure. All tillage tools decrease water infiltration. If you take a long-term no-till field that has good macrophores and full vertical <coughs> tillage tools through it, you'll cut the infiltration rate in half. We got into no-till because we wanted to make water go in the soil under irrigation. And we want to maximize our water efficiency under irrigation. We took it to dry land because it's a much better idea under dry land than under irrigation. Under irrigation, if you don't live in Texas or someplace and you, and you have enough money, you can, you can actually pump more water if you waste some. The reason say Texas, they've overused their water, so now they're being restricted. All tillage tools reduce organic matter. All tillage tools increase weeds, and we saw both of the, all those things today. See, so I'm supposed to wrap it up. Uh, 27,000 gallons of water with 1% organic matter and six inches of soil. This is a quarter of an inch. If we can increase organic matter by 4%, which is gonna take a while, uh, that is one inch in the top six inches and two inches in the top foot. Think of what, go find a place that hasn't been tilled and see how much organic matter, and then use these numbers. And then think about, in the old days when Grandpa was farming it, and he got a big rain, or he got these big rains, and that, that soil filled up, but it didn't get waterlogged. Now we've taken the organic matter out, and we get these rains, and we get waterlogged. So our response is not to go back and put organic matter in there like we should have. Our response is to put in drain time to get rid of the water. We live in South Dakota. When Ruth and I drove down here today, we came from Chamberlain to Mitchell. I grew up in Platt. I spent a lot of time in this circle. Kind of like when them moose show up from Canada. You know, they're looking for something. When you're an adolescent male, you do a lot of traveling around. <laughs> there so I did that. I, I obviously wasn't successful. I go all the way to Canada to find a find a wife, but, um, <clears throat> you know, it gets dry here, and we're doing a better job of managing water, but we're not Iowa, and Iowa is starting to get in the same thing. Just think about how often they're too dry, and then they're too wet, and then they get flooding, and then they're too dry, and then they're too wet, and then they get flooding, and we get flooding because the soils aren't holding the water like they used to, and sooner or later, somebody's got to tell the truth. I know you guys do manure here. We can put manure on in, in no-till. Uh, compost can be, that's a composter, and, and a young kids could make money running around farm to farm and doing this, right? That's not a, a real fancy thing. It can be injected with a lot of our low disturbance openers. You put it in air cedar, you know, screen it, put it in air cedar, and go out and put it on. 
Uh, it can be applied on the surface under a growing crop. It, liquid can be applied on, in, on the surface under a growing crop. That's the way the Danish farmers do it. I guess more Dan Danish people coming here, they have to do that. Uh, it can be injected with a load to surface opener. It can be applied on the surface legally in South Dakota if you're a long-term no-tiller, but you lose a lot of them. And then putting cattle on the land is the best way to do it. Okay. Uh, now, one of the big controversies this year was pheasants. Why don't we have any pheasants? Because we don't have anything habitat. It's that easy, right? We need habitat. You need to have small grains and undisturbed habitat in the spring. That's why Ducks Unlimited gave Dakota Lakes Research Farm $20,000 a long time ago, because we allowed them to do no-tilling, allowed them to take winter wheat way further north which really helped the ducks. And it was our help in, in them doing that that it is important to the ducks, it's also important to the pheasants. So they have undisturbed habitat with lots of residue, so planting into wheat stubble was something early in the spring. And that's one of the places where that stacked wheat stubble, for instance, does, does wonders. What do baby chicks eat, pheasants? Insects, thank you. Okay, so what happens if you go out and spray a fungicide and an herbicide and an insecticide and you spray your wheat all at the same time. Don't have any bugs. We don't have any habitat and then our wheat stubble don't have any, or our wheat ground doesn't have any bugs if we do that. <clears throat> well, what about bugs? Aphids are the real bad guy. Aphids are pregnant females that give birth to pregnant females. Women's live on steroids, right? <laughs> <laughs> so once they're there, aren't they, aren't you just have no other option but to kill them? Because they're just going to keep having more and more babies. Well, not necessarily. There's a lot of things that impact them. Temperatures and natural enemies and whatever. One seven-spotted lady beetle female eats 115 soybean aphids in 24 hours. The males eat 78. And the instars, the little babies, ate 105. So if you're going to go count your aphids, you better count your ladybirds. You're friendly, okay? I've got more of those data, but we'll go on to this. Is a fungi that affects aphids. There's actually hundreds of fungi that kill aphids. In fact, the number one thing that gets aphids dead is fungi. So if you go out and spray a bunch of fungicides in your soybean spring just because it's going to make it look healthier, and you put a little insecticide in it too, you're going to kill your friendlies and you're going to kill your fungi. If I leave this alone, it caused an 84% infection outbreak of soybean aphids in, in 2003, after which the aphid population crashed. And overuse of fungicides causes insect outbreaks. Yeah. Okay, if we take out the beneficial fungi, the insects will take off. And this is a, a documented case in potatoes. One of the things we do with our cover crop is we try to have some that flower to attract predators in the fall. And had one of my farmers came over and we had a bunch of insects in this mighty mustard. He said, don't you think you should spray this? I said, well, of course, we've got to spray these bugs. They said, no, they're feeding my predators. I'm not going to spray these bugs. They're feeding my dang predators. I want my predators here when my insects, the bad insects, show up the next spring. Over reliance on herbicides leads to resistant wheat. Randy <clears throat> Anderson did a really good job today talking about the wheat thing, so I'm not going to spend very much time on that. But if we're using only herbicides, if you're spraying Roundup on a given weed at the same time every year because you're doing Roundup Ready corn, Roundup Ready soybean, it's really no surprise that you're going to get resistant weeds. If you get the Farm Journal, read that little article I wrote about Nolan Ryan, right? Nolan Ryan was a good pitcher because he did more than a fastball. If all he did is a fastball, everybody was hitting right out of the park. The same way with your herbicide, okay? If you use surfactants too frequently, they may increase disease issues. What's the big disease issue in corn right now? Cost as well. 
Cause as well. What is cause as well? Bacteria. The bacteria. When do we used to get? This guy's good. We're going to give him PhD here. He gets another one, right? <laughs> <laughs> when do we used to get cause as well? Hailstorms, windstorms, dust storms, something that damaged the waxy <coughs> leaf on the corn. When did we used to get bacterial blight and wheat? When we had something that damaged the waxy leaf on the wheat. Same way with bacterial diseases on soybeans. What are we doing now to damage the waxy leaf on the plant? We're using surfactants. What's the number one thing that makes the dealer the most money? Surfactants, insect, uh, insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides. Surfactants are the most market. Fungicides, herbicides, and insecticides cause collateral damage. They are disturbance, just like tillage or anything else. We're trying to use chloride to take care of some of the tan spotting things. And, and I think Ray thinks it's important in corn as well, right? So to have our chloride levels up to keep our disease levels down. High disturbance technique increased weed pressure. Randy talked about that. And it caused tillage erosion. And uh, yeah, Anthony talked about that. Okay, so I don't have to. Sanitation, rotation, and competition are primary methods of pest control. Herbicides are only part of sanitation, keep weeds from going to seed. They're only part of competition, they keep that weed down until I can get a good crop canopy. That's all I need to use herbicides for. I don't have to kill something. I just have to knock it down until my plants, my beneficial gets ahead. Pesticides are only part of sanitation. They're only part of rotation and competition. Fertilizer placements are really important to give my crops a head start. Ecosystems that leak nutrients. If I put in a drain tile and it takes my lime, and my gypsum, so that's what's in the saline seat. Right, Ray? There we go, uh, Ray here, Ray knows these things. If that takes them to the ocean, then I, <clears throat> I turn my area into a desert. People want us to be organic, but if we don't, if we're gonna export nutrients, a, a one big unit train of soybeans carries a million pounds of phosphorus. If we're going to export our nutrients, we have to put it back on. But we export them, if we let them go out in drain tile, we export them. If we let them go down where we can't recover them, we export them. If we sell them, and don't replace them. Sailing seeds are symptoms that you don't have your nutrient water cycling right. What you need to do is cycle your nutrients in water. Now, nutrient placement is part of cycling in, in that I put it where my plant's most likely to get it instead of where it can go away. I'm a farmer. I take sunlight, water, carbon dioxide, and turn them into products we can sell. That's it. And who said that first this morning? Right yet. See, these guys are really good. Right? Because they're just, you're eating sunlight. Concentrate on having your soil moist during the dry part of the year. Think about that. You know, we're so worried about having it dry so I can be the first guy done planting. And I've got a guy kitty corner across the road from me that beats up this little 40 acre patch and gets it planted, got all his fertilizer on it, and the boy, it just dark green and pretty at field day day, end of June. <coughs> irrigated, gravity irrigated corn. And everybody goes and comes in and they look at my corn where it's got the stubble behind it, doesn't look as big, it's actually just as big, but it doesn't look as big. And they go, that guy's corn over there is better than you. And I've begun now to just say, oh, you, you harvest corn in June? And look very confused and walk away. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to dry during the wet part of the year. That's what everybody wants, but concentrate on having it wet during the dry part of the year. Concentrate on having the soil cool during the hot part of the year. Because roots don't like hot soil. And they don't function, these microbes don't function well during, in, in dry soils or hot soils. Okay, if you study Hans Yeni, right, right, remember Hans Yeni? 
I don't remember him. I'm, I'm not that old. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Factors in soil formation, 1937. Paul Carson studied with Hans Jenny, okay? Uh, Paul Carson was our major professor. As you get cooler environments, your organic matter goes up. As you get warmer environments, your organic matter goes out, down. Remember this stuff he showed from Texas where that ground, that land, that they just white. Because they have hot soils and they kill the hell out of it in Texas. And they turn it white. Okay? If you're going to build organic matter, the more you can keep it cool, the more the faster you're going to build the organic matter. So the more we try to heat it up, and the more of it we try to heat it. So if we're going to heat anything, we're only going to have that little tiny patch. Okay? Covered forage crops are just one tool. It gives us a chance to provide an increase in diversity and intensity where we can't do it uh, otherwise. You can grow crops and get diversity and not ever do a cover crop fine. Okay? So don't get too excited about cover crops are the only thing. Remember that if you can build soil structure, then you can start planting earlier. If you get stranded in the back 40 in the rain, you drive home across the pasture the plow the field. Like you guys have seen me use this for 20 years. There's all that hotel you just can't get on it in the spring. So you can drive around out in the pasture. I'm worried about my cows out on my ground. They're going to pack it. If you put them out in the pasture, they're okay. And the difference is you have soil structure in the pasture. Right? <clears throat> the human environment, tall grass prairie or wetter, probably east of here, this little bit here in the east, you should have something growing at all times. Okay, and, and we have to figure out how to do that yet and get these things started. It's something we need to do. We have a lot of research to do on this. But there's no money for doing this research because there's no grants available to do this research to speak of. Because there's nobody that's going to make tons of money on okay? And other than you as farmer. In some humid semi-arid and arid areas like here and west, we use them when we have the opportunity. We don't do a lots of cover cropping on our dry land up here for obvious reasons, unless we're going to do some kind of a forage thing. So 10 things, you know, back always has 10 things. Decide what you want to do before trying to choose a cover crop or a forage crop or whatever. Everybody goes, Oh, my neighbor's doing a cover crop. I better do that. Radishes. Right? Odette Menard, the other day at the AIM <coughs> conference in Kansas, where that she participated with Ray and I doing, just raised all kinds. She's from Quebec. She's a Quebecois. She's a French-speaking Canadian. She just raised all kinds of hell with, with, with radishes. She said, if you want to take care of compaction, you need little roots, not great big roots. Notice those pictures you saw of the radish. They had the thing sticking up out of the ground. They went down there and hit that hard spot and went, no, I'll go this way. <laughs> <laughs> right? And it's not going to stay open. It's too big. You want a bunch of little tiny roots that go through there and stabilize that soil and hold it from getting together. You want lots of little tiny roots. And I do brassicas, but I do dwarf essex grape seeds. They have, a, they have a thing about like this. We're likely to get through and, and find things, okay? Then for cover crop is just another component. Your rotation, using a mixture of cover crop, which we do a lot of, adds a lot more diversity, and it kind of each of them fills a niche. And one of the things we do in this fall thing is we'll have oats and hay millet. And as the hay millet gets whacked by the frost, the oats starts coming through. That's an example. Cow peas and peas and chickling batch and lentils. And the cow peas dies when it gets to be about 37 degrees. And they just go south, right? And then the next one comes on. And that's the way the, the native prairie works. Great conditions, beneficial. The next crop is the most important thing. Okay? That's what you're there for. Water nutrient management. And that's what a lot of guys mentioned. Using this excess water, you do have excess water if you try to wait from July until the next June. So that's when your corn's going to start using water. Your, how much water does your soil hold? Use your web soil survey. Find out. The best ones are 10 inches. Most of them are 8 inches. Well, you get a lot more than 8 inches between when you harvest wheat and when you plant corn. Okay, so instead of wasting it, let's use it for something beneficial. 
understand your rainfall patterns. Use your wet soil survey rainfall data. Uh, they must be inexpensive. Not necessarily cheap, but in, inexpensive relative to their potential impact. And one of the things we do is look in the shed. Whatever seed we got left over, that makes a good start. Okay. Uh, small seeds grow better on the surface. If you're going to surface broadcast, larger seeds uh, usually emerge better uh, through a matter of residue. And that's one of the things, again, through a matter of residue, the larger seeds do that. And if you're going to put small seeds and you got a matter of residue, put some large seeds with them to show them the way. And that, that actually works. Grant boys used to put oats with alfalfa. And everybody said, well, he did that because it shaded the alfalfa or did something, right? No, it just helped the damn alfalfa get out of the ground. That's really what I think most of the oats did. Uh, if you use a harrow or something, you know, to, to try to get your cover crop to grow, it's going to make the weeds grow. It's going to do what Randy Anderson said. <clears throat> Vertical tillage to do the same thing. It just makes the weeds really mad. <laughs> and they all start growing, okay? Uh, one important goal is to use a cover crop to balance the diet of soil organisms. And that's really all you got to think about. Just pretend that they're little tiny cows. And you're just going to balance the diet. So if you've got a big corn, wheat crop thing, and you want to turn that into organic matter, you've got to add some nitrogen to it. So then you put a nitrogen cover crop in there. But you're not going to feed 50-50 to a cow. You're going to have about... 70, 80 percent uh, carbohydrate and, and some protein. Okay? So you're, a lot of guys get way too car carried away on the broadleaves and they burn up. If you put too many broadleaves in, you burn up organic matter, not build organic matter. <coughs> organic matter is very high in carbon. Okay? Most of the cover crops guys are putting in don't have enough carbon in. Still a bit of guesswork. Okay? Should be no use to need to use ground engaging components to seed a cover crop. We should be able to use something like clay, clay seed balls. Just go blast them out there. And Google one straw revolution. And, and there's a guy in Japan that's doing that. They just have these little balls of clay and peat and seed and whatever, and they just throw them out there and then they grow. Okay. Uh, using a perennial sequence or perennial cover crop will be necessary. If we try to do only annual cropping, one of the reasons we've got so many saline seeds, we have too many annual crops. They don't have root systems like the perennial. Grandpa used to come along and every so often he put in grass and alfalfa and these kind of things and he'd reset, hit the reset button, he'd build his organic matter, he'd get rid of the weeds, right? He'd suck up a bunch of this nutrient that had gotten beyond the depth that you can get with annual crops, you bring that back to the surface. And how many guys here have pHs that are going down? Most of you. It's because you're leaking lime and stuff out the bottom. You're not cycling it back to the surface. If you put that into perennial for three years, that pH would jump right back up again. You go down and get that lime. I noticed in Charlie, pitcher had a bunch of free lime. <laughs> that pitcher is whole, right? Just gotta get that back to the surface. The lime's here. Now the guys that are putting in the drain tile want to sell you lime and gypsum. First they give you the drain tile to get rid of your lime and gypsum, and then they're going to sell you something to replace it. They have a business point. I mean, I, I really admire the business savvy of some of these guys. <clears throat> so, they help you. The perennials help you with your nutrient cycle, or with your rotational flexibility, and building organic matter. Do all these things. Strip tail still has some proponents, right? Is it, <coughs> when are you going to do it? If you don't have corn beans, beans, there's no time, right? Is it a fertilizer response or a closing wheel response? And Anthony talked about the closing wheel thing. That's a lot of the reasons the guy started to strip tail. Couldn't get good stands because they had crappy closing wheels, okay? What if you don't get it done and you don't have your thing set up to do fertilizer, okay? And this is what, I took this picture just west of Mitchell several years ago. And I like, it, I love this one because I go, this guy, you know, he's got this thing here. This is a strip till. And, and it's, he's going to try, Charlie talked about trying to follow their stuff, right? Because the RTK wasn't right, see? 
This guy had auto steer. Auto steer better than that. See that? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, if you love to cultivate, you love strip tail. We did strip tail in the 80s. And, and it just, God, we had all these problems with it. More weeds, just think of what Randy said. Look how many more weeds you're going to have. And, and I said that to Monsanto. I said, not a problem because we got around the pretty corn. Okay, well, now it's a problem, right? So, <laughs> okay, now, and if they do it right, drip till here may a little bit more than no till, but what they're doing is they're doing a different fertility treatment. They were putting extra phosphorus on the strip till. Okay, so they're putting a bunch of phosphorus down plus a, a pop-up. And I said, okay, let's do it the same. Or even here, they didn't make any money on it. And if they did it the same, you have to compare uh, this one to this one. These are the same. Well, no till one. Okay, the other one's a, a fertility difference, see? So, let's do it all at one time. That way it's done. We've done this for years. I've never not done this, actually, since probably the 80s, where we put our fertility on when we plant. We cut the residue at the front, move the residue with the little residue manager, plant <coughs> corn, and then put a little bit of phosphorus with the seed. But this cutter here helps us get through residue without doing much disturbance. Very low disturbance thing. The fertilizer's right next door. We don't have any weeds here that can grow because they're covered with residue. Remember Randy Anderson stuff? And then there we have the fertility right next to the row so it gets off to a fast start and doesn't have a chance. And this is, I have this one in because I was making fun of Mike Arnley the other day. And I just left it in with so much fun. But Mike Arnley from Kennebec, a lot of people have trouble with stocks jumping up and grabbing their gathering chains and stuff, right? Well, the industry wants you to get these chopping corn heads. They're, I don't know, hundred and something thousand dollars a piece. Mike put this bar on here. This is a piece of rebar. <laughs> this kind of leans them in his direction. So he doesn't have to worry about it. So I, I was making fun of him the other day. Now what I did is I rearranged this because the pointer isn't all so good. So I rearranged this so <coughs> the only ones are on top. So you can just read down, right? These are fertilizer studies we've done forever, looking at placement. You read in the side, starter to the side, pop up with the seed. That's what those numbers are. And just look, every time you'll see that, that treatment where we're doing all three of those is pretty much on top. But for sure, that urea or that nitrogen to the side is always up there near the top. And we got the 28% on top of the treatment, surface, phosphorus, that's what a lot of guys do, and maybe a little bit of pop-up, that's at the bottom. Now, it's not a big deal. I mean, you're looking you know, it, it's only 11 bushels, right? No, a little more than that. Six, seven, 13 bushels. And that used to be a big deal when it was $7 corn. But now it were $4 corn, it's not a big deal. 13 times 4, right? It's only 50 bucks. I'm joking. Slow <laughs> people. <laughs> you read up the C there, there you're, you're read the size at the top. Now 215 versus 215 bushels. Here there's not much bushels, the difference only three. Okay? But it's never less. Okay, Ken Ferry and Missy Bauer, right? They figured that out. The last farm journal. They came out and said, boy, there's a response to starter fertilizers. So the people that have known me for 20 years, they're going, yeah, we knew that. Long time ago. In the corn belt where they do conventional till, they only get one response out of 11. But they get eight out of 11. This is old days. We've known that for a long time. One of the problems with no-till is people try to no-till without fertilizer placement. So where do we want to put the fertilizer? Under the seed, everybody says. <coughs> Everybody's over there going, yeah, I bet it is. So here's the corn seed, see? 
And that little radical does not pick up any nutrients. Okay? So C to the dominant P source through B1, which is when that first leaf opened up, first true leaf. No fertilizer nutrients are needed, but if you get too much in the trench, it can hurt you. But you put a little bit in there, it's fine. And then once you get past B1 and that thing perceives light, it puts those roots up right underneath the soil surface. Those are the roots that do the feeding. So what you want your fertilizer to be is right where that blue line is, right here, two inches, three inches to the side and at the same depth as the seed in O2. Not two inches below, two inches below in conventional till because it's too dang dry for a root to grow in the surface. Okay? So this our little residue manager doesn't have to be very aggressive. Again, just like that. Okay? In case you're a slow learner sleeping through that, it's oh no. I want to do script till. Think of the week. Think what else happened. This is from <coughs> this is from a a Aberdeen, big rain and now what do you do? I know what you do. You get out your no-till disc. Doesn't this make a lot more sense? I mean, I just don't understand why we're doing all this stuff. Uh, this is our closing system here that we use. It's one we've designed. It's got a vertical wheel instead of the Keaton. The Keatons are okay, but I don't like them much. We've got a vertical wheel. We think it's better. But notice how close these are together at the back. That gives us clearance. Now I'm going to show you some experiments we did with where we placed the phosphorus. Okay? The Olsen P on this field is less than five parts per million. Think about how low that is. Okay? Very low. So we went in, we put six on all of these, we put 60 pounds in someplace. Put the starter piece some places in this in the first case it's to the side in that side band and then we had to pop up and then here we had no pop up deal with those two to the side and then here we put the end over the row in between those two blades at the end so it's concentrated right over the row but on the surface almost 20 bushel difference and then here we put it in the middle Put it there. Just the same as all those other ones. Get it in the ground, get it in proximity. Now, let's look at if it's an N thing or a P thing. So we put, in this case, we put all the nitrogen in the side band. Okay, so those are all the same. And then we put starter P in the side band <coughs> or not. See, so the first one we had, or, or the pop up. So the first one we had no starter P, a little bit of pop up 212. Uh, starter, starter P and pop up 206. <coughs> right? Starter P, no pop up 206. No pop up at all 204. Five parts per million. What's happening? Ray shaking his head. How can that be? But think of what Mike said. Mike Lehman's talking about all these hyphae out there that we have now. This is 20 some years of no-till. They're out there helping us get phosphorus from the soil. There's actually several hundred pounds of total phosphorus there. What the Olson test is telling us is that it's not in this real soluble form. But we have quite a bit of phosphorus here. And it just helps me get that. Now, if I went out in that field of utility and killed the mycorrhizae and then did this test, I'd get a huge response to phosphorus. And what's happening, what, what Ray is doing, is he's, now he can't assume, when he gives a recommendation, he can't assume that the guy, the long-term no-tiller, got good mycorrhizae, isn't too, and they're the mycorrhizae or fungi. So if I overuse fungicides, I kill mycorrhizae too. So I'm not doing that. Okay? Interesting data. Let's start planting corn into corn. So that's how you do that. 
we do have autos here. Keep the residue in place from last year's crop until this crop, this year's crop is established. We put our <clears throat> fertilizer in proximity to the seed or we put it on the surface after crop canopy. If you put it on before then, it encourages weeds. The three key factors are available nutrient, moisture, and roots. What I have is very, very big root system. So if I have bigger root systems, because I do better rotations, I don't need as much available nutrient. And that's really what it is. It's a balancing <coughs> thing. And that's not anything new. Cook and be set. When we grow the soil highly infested with root pathogens owing to lack of rotation, we'll see response to phosphorus fertilizer even when high concentrations are available. So you can have lots of phosphorus there and have a phosphorus deficiency if you've got crappy roots. And you often see that. The old rich tail get days when guys got too close to where their cutaway gets. They get potassium deficiency because they cut off the roots. Okay? Savings might be expected in the amount of fertilizer, irrigation, water, and healthy roots. Biological control of the soil and residue and having pests to weed is accomplished by non growing weed more frequently in every second or third year. I can put corn there. So these guys try to go corn on corn on corn. And I've got, I've got a field of corn we've done since 1990. It's not as easy as when I wrote it. Okay? Crop rotation allows time for these things to go away naturally. So. We choose a sustainable economic approach <clears throat> that takes advantage of nature's systems. Adequate diversity, at least three crop types, long intervals, two to four years. And go on my website, we've got a really nice paper on crop rotations there, okay? <clears throat> Just looking at what Randy Anderson was saying, I'm not gonna do any more than this, but if you've got resistant weeds like amaranth or if you do a continuous roundup thing, corn bean every other year spraying at the same time, you get 10 million really fast. If you do real diverse rotations, you get no problem. Okay, so let's just look at a little bit of data. Corn soybean rotation, where we use cover crops, we get 7.3 bushel <coughs> acre on average over where no cover crop is used in corn soybean rotation under irrigation here. In 2013 this year, soybean with cover crop yielded 62.9. We would have expected around 55.6. We don't do any without cover crop anymore. Every bit of our soybeans in the corn ground gets a cover crop of, of, of winter wheat or cereal rye or something like that. Plant it after we harvest the corn. We don't care if it comes up or not. We get that increase. So 62.9. If I do that diverse rotation corn, corn, soybean, wheat, soybean, <clears throat> the first year soybeans this year were 76.3, the second year soybeans were 81.2. That's a huge difference in soybean yield. People say, oh, I can't make money on soybeans anymore here. They don't compete with corn, not if you're doing them every other year. That's too often to do soybeans. And we just started a new rotation, which is corn, corn, Soybean wheat, taking the second soybean out. Okay? So cover crop increased soybean yield by 7.3, but that diverse rotation increased soybean yield by 15.9 on average. Continuous corn, 203, that's a long term average, 203 bushel acre. Corn soybean, 217, and our more diverse rotations average about 235. So if I put Said on my whole farm, we're going to do continuous corn. I get on, on, on 5,000 acres, I get a million bushels of corn. I'd have to own 18 combines, 200 grain dryers, right? I mean, think about that. How hard that it would be to harvest 5,000 acres of continuous corn. Uh, <clears throat> corn, soybean, I get this, and then corn, corn, soybean, wheat, soybean, I get that. If I <clears throat> Get more realistic and say 2,000 acres total. Total money is 1.59599 million for continuous corn. A little less for corn soybean, which is 
what you'd expect. If I do this more reverse rotation, it's more, 1.744 million. By putting that wheat and whatever in there still in the same 2,000 acres, it's cheaper to grow. This is just gross income, and this is way cheaper to grow. And then if I did that corn, corn, soybean, wheat one, it'd be 1.66. If I get more realistic yet, say if I'm going to continue corn 2,000 acres about it, if I do corn, soybean, maybe I can do three or 4,000 acres. If I do this other one, I might be able to do 5,000. That's really one of the magic things there. <coughs> The big thing about what we're trying to do is build soil structure. This is the picture I took in Argentina in 1996. And it was, they did seven years of pasture, seven years of cropping, and their cropping was diverse with cover crops. So that, you see a, a black oak cover crop on the far side there, and then no cover crop on this side. And I had my friend Ron Elverson, who I thought might be here today, hold some soil so I can take a picture of, of it. Everybody talks soil health. Define what it takes to be healthy, a healthy soil. I like to challenge people to define a handsome man or a beautiful woman. Write down a definition. You can't do it. It's not possible. But we all know one when we see one. This is one. <laughs> Okay, that's a healthy soil. And then the Argentine government outlawed this export of beef. So everybody quit growing cattle, took out their pastures, started continuous cropping, and mostly doing soybeans on soybeans on soybeans. Because the roads won't really allow them to export corn, too many bushels, and too bad a road. Okay? I went back to that same field in 19, or 2006, 10 years later. There's the same soil. <laughs> Absolutely insane. And that's what we've done. I find clayey soil all over. And corn soybeans is just not enough diversity, but it's not enough carbon. The native prairie was 80% grasses. So we got to somehow get our carbon up because we're just mining the organic matter out of our soil. So we put in high carbon cover crops. This would be that oats, hay millet thing. There's oats about ready to come up from underneath in there. Stripper, he's headed wheat straw. You can see on the left, that's a, that's a check. Uh, here's one that we did with the Buffett project with Forgy, from the Forgy. This is oats pea mixture that they swath and harvested for forage for bales, and they put the bales over the edge of the field. And then they put in uh, hay millets and, and uh, pearl millet and that kind of stuff, and they harvested that for forage. You can see they swathed it for forage, and then they planted between the swaths with, <laughs> that was my idea, it worked so good, it was really neat. They planted between the swaths with their little 750 drill, Right? And then they were supposed to put the oat bales back out, use them in a string to, to maintain the cows so they could do real intensive swath raising, but we didn't get that part of it done. I think it's your Traeger, is that you? Yes, it is. They're Traeger, but I didn't see him earlier. He's here. He's one of, one of the Cronin next generation. And anyway, there's swath graze. That's their, you see how the cows are eating it and they eat it on down to the point where now they're starting to eat the stuff in between. Okay? When soil water storage capacity is low, which we've done outdoor soil, much of the rain that falls during extended periods of pre precipitation is lost. In contrast, the high water storage capacity soil combined with the effect you capture rain with macropores and all this kind of stuff and snow melt over the fall, winter, and spring can support crops for an extended dry period. That's as easy as it gets. That's, within all texture groups, as organic matter increases from 1 to 3 percent, the available water capacity approximately doubled. When organic matter comes in, increases 4 percent, it then accounted for more than 60 percent of the available water holding capacity. Okay? <clears throat> now, some of the
other things you hear. Again, this was that Corona, that straight corn, they were going to cut this for silage, and this is corn with soybeans planted in between, both without nitrogen. Mycorrhizae allow the corn to get nitrogen from the soybean, the way it works in the prairie. Okay? Here's our alfalfa that we, in our continuous corn now, under irrigation, we have an understory of alfalfa. And that's my perennial cover crop. The other one that you'll see in Australia is switchgrass, used as a summer grazer, and then they grow over the wintertime grow canola and wheat and whatever during their rainy winter period. And then when that's harvested, they let the grass come back and use it as a grazer. Look at the root system on the prairie. We're not even close to doing that. <coughs> These are my three daughters of several years ago. One on the right now is going to graduate from college, one on the left is a junior, and the other one's a senior in high school. Uh, <laughs> you know, they just got big. <laughs> Why do we still have people who don't use no-till rotations or have livestock? What's the problem? Because we got the technology to do this. We know how to do it. <clears throat> Some political or whatever. Could it be that the total subsidy for crop insurance in 2013 was $14 billion? Federal government subsidy was $14 billion for crop insurance. Well, that's a small part of the Farm Bill. Big part is stamp. Well, there's 14 million people that get food stamps. They get $80 billion a year. That's $1,700 per person. I don't think I'd want to try to feed myself on $1,700 a year. <clears throat> crop insurance with 1.2 million crop insurance policies with subsidies. $14 billion, so each, each of those policies average $11,700 for the subsidy. <clears throat> if subsidized crop insurance is good, then subsidized health insurance must be good also, right? Because <laughs> 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 Charlie's mom's a very dear friend of mine and Wayne. And we're having this discussion and they put this to Janet one day. And she goes, well, they don't subsidize for I'm sure. I go, yes, they do. She said, no, they don't. I said, yes, they do. She said, no, they don't. I said, ask Chet. So I asked Chet today if you had that discussion. He said, yes, I had that discussion with you. So she must believe me, yes. <laughs> but maybe not. The total, 14 billion for subsidized crop insurance, the total federal budget for agriculture research last year was 2.6 billion. One sixth as much. Just think about it. Making sense? 1.3 billion of that were short term grants, the NIFA, from the federal government to the states and their one or two, two year grants. USDA, the guys like Mike Clayman, and the direct grants to the states that used to be the way they supported research are the other 1.3. So the only long-term research is that little part of that 1.3 that comes out <clears throat> to the states. So is an answer to give the crop insurance subsidy or part of it to the states as a direct grant, let them work on uh, research on developing these sustainable systems, alternative <clears throat> energy and such. Would we make that trade off? Said, well, if you're gonna spend that money, let's do this instead. But you gotta ask for that. Spend some of that money educating the public on what the good growers are doing. So you don't have people asking Ray for organic farming, <laughs> not understanding what's going on. Ecosystems are connected. We can't just ignore what's happening in China and the rest of the world in terms of pollution because if it pollutes them, it's polluting us. So take the E out of ET and take the T out of camp. Let Mother Nature do it. Thank you. Any questions for Dwayne? Yes, sir. Dwayne. I realize you're out by pier and stuff, but you know, the problem we run into is we've got some soils that are kind of heavy and wet without any, and maybe if you're in a no-till system long enough, but I mean, 
we get those big rains in the spring and without some sort of airing it out you lose a couple weeks of planting time or delay it that much sometimes it's a trade-off to run some sort of minimum tillage I mean I don't know you got an answer for that <laughs> well you got to remember I started this at Redfield <clears throat> on lacustrian soils and lacustrian soils are old glacial lake bottom let's start with that so I'm very familiar with what you're talking about and I grew up flat and, and the big thing is soil structure. So if you're really challenged, you've got some challenging soil, the first thing you got to do is probably throw them in perennials for a couple of years. And then come on that. I mean, the guys that had the CRP have the perfect, perfect chance to do that. But you got to be building soil structure. The thing we would do is we'd start with a couple of years a week to really try to build soil structure. Spring week, winter week, because then you're planting. So you're planting in the in the fall the second year and then you get the cover crop in after that and that really gets you kind of rolling that does make sense because i mean i had some crp that came out you know it was a wet year and no tilled into it and like say you could if you had good flotation of the tractor you could drive through standing water to seed it and you know for the most part it turned out pretty decent yeah and you notice the size of the tires on that tractor one very 800 metric very big fat tire low low pressure type you know that's that's part of the answer but you know when we moved to here we had some really degraded soil terrible and I actually had you know for first year or two we had issues with dropping through and whatever and I even there because I was going well I'm out of here now right mm -hmm. no we got the same problem there and in fact we probably have more problems because we have to be more conservative in terms of our rotation we can't use all of our can't push the the cover crops is hard because we may not get that rain in the spring you guys are more likely to get here so yeah it makes sense because like say it that would be a good answer to it because you know when you're out there and you plug up a plant and you spend four hours digging it's pretty easy to get that vertical till but, off. but we're asking the wrong question <clears throat> i had that real brief slide in there that says we shouldn't need a ground engaging tool to plant a crop right and i was buzzing through it place evolved here's the other one Take something that looks like this as a golf tee, you can't see it. We can have seed stakes that look like this, and then all you have to do is go across with a hovercraft and shoot them in the ground. That'd probably be pretty cheap. <laughs> well, I mean, just think of I mean, we haven't really wrapped our mind around we don't yeah. want to disturb the soil. How are we going to do this? Yeah. See, we haven't quite given up that tillage thing. What we're really doing is we're tilling that little zone. We haven't quite given up on the fact that we really shouldn't be doing any of that. Mother Nature has never done tillage. That big red cedar, when the guy from the PD guy, the product development guy from Case IH, flew to South Dakota to meet with me one March day and said, what's the best no-till cedar ever made? Meaning, what one can we buy, paint it red, call it Case? <laughs> right and I said well the, the buffalo and he said oh the one out of Nebraska I said no the brown one was horn <laughs> <laughs> it's seeded the prairie for millennia before we got here right and they will do it when we leave yeah. okay anybody else <coughs> questions <coughs> all right Prior to corn. Prior to corn, yeah. Right. So you were saying you need more grass to cover crop. Need more carbon. Yeah. And, uh, and you can get more carbon by letting it be more mature. You can get more carbon by using something like flax, which is the thing that's in almost all of our, a great number of our rotations. Because it's stiff, it's high in carbon, it is a broadleaf. You can, you can think back to what Mike Lehman said. Mike Lehman. <coughs> Gotta get, keep giving him all these plugs and he's out of the room. He's not gonna give me money. Oats. <laughs> oats in front of, remember how good oats looked in front of corn? So if you're coming in and you're gonna put a bunch of broadleaves in there, <coughs> you have oats with your broadleaves. Remember what I showed with the, the corn taking the nitrogen from the legume? So you put a legume and a non-legume together, and then that, that, that non-legume makes the legume work harder, 
and gets more nitrogen into this form. And Ray would tell you that it takes carbon and nitrogen to make organic matter. So just having the, the radishes and stuff out there, they don't have enough carbon. And that stuff just burns out. And, and so you're not really making organic matter, you're burning off organic matter. So some oats in there gives you a nice fibrous root system. So if, if you would drive by Dakota Lakes today and look <coughs> at field 27, it had a mixture of cow peas, peas, lentils, uh, dwarf essex rapeseed, uh, flax, oats, and annual ryegrass. And that was planted into wheat stubble going to corn, so it had volunteer wheat in it. So it's got a lot of these high carbon things in there. And you're okay with the little half of the seeds that used for grass stumps? Oats to corn. Now, I, you, didn't, you didn't hear me say millet. <laughs> right? You didn't hear me say millet, any, any kind of millet, because that's the ones that don't take a trough. But it's all a trade off. But we want to build, that's a field that's very badly, it's been corn soybean for 20 some years, it's been degraded. But that was part of what we were trying to prove. So we've now, we're going to jump start and really crank it up. Hey, one more question for Dwayne. And how do you do your tilling? I told somebody I'll give you an M with a, with a or a, an H with a steel seat, and you can go with an M plow when you want to. <laughs> <laughs> and no radio, right? <laughs> but but you know one of the things that and and I'll, and I'll do this and I quit. But my grandfather who homesteaded in Brule County. Uh, when he planted his oats, he had sweet clover with it. And then when he ran the binder behind the horses, he sat on the platform and spread dwarf essex or some kind of rapeseed from the seat. And then when they had the shocks built, they turned the sheep out because the sheep would not bother the shocks if they had green stuff to eat. And then when they got the shocks threshed, then they turned the cows out. Same thing we're doing now. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's really not that dissimilar. And I, you know, I think that one with clover in the in the wheat is one we really need to try. Art, you know, that's one of the things that overseeding that gets by this. What? Do we, how do we get something started? But, you know, that we got to do some research on that. But there just isn't there isn't the impetus to do that. But there's a lot of research that could really make this. 